Yes, welcome into Sports Bit. Betty and Inside today, Paulie and Teddy. Thursday, June 29th. Big game breakdown, a day game, the Cubs and the Nationals, and the deep dive. NFC North today, the Chicago Bears could be the worst team in the NFC, in my opinion. We'll go back and forth on them coming up. Bad beats, bad bets, bad for the books in a second. Again, major news when you wake up. Phil Jackson out with the Knicks and CP3 traded to the Rockets. They've adjusted their odds at Bet Online 25 to 1 to 14 to 1 to win the title. They went from 30 to 1 to 15 to 1 here at Vegas at the Westgate. Uh, I got to see what's next. I think a great job by the Clippers that Paul says, I'm signing with the Rockets, and they're able to get all these players in return. CP3 is only under contract for one more year. This could be an unmitigated disaster for the Rockets if he's one and done and leaves Houston. I don't think it would be an unmitigated disaster for the Rockets, and I think that Houston has to make a move to try to one-up Golden State. They weren't going to beat the Rockets or the, the Warriors with the roster that they had last year. Bringing in a superstar like Chris Paul isn't going to hurt them in that chase against Golden State. But look what they sent. Sam Decker, Patrick Beverly, Lou Williams, DeAndre Liggins, Darren Hilliard, Montreal uh, uh, Harrell, and, and Kyle Wilcher. They had to pick up half those guys over the course of the day just to make the deal work. Uh, plus a top three protected 2018 first round pick and $661,000 all for Chris Paul on, a, in theory, a one-year rental. Now, of course, you talked about what Dave Mason and BOL did when they adjusted the odds, and you don't often see odds halved on a team after a move. You know, we, we saw it only when Cleveland uh, got LeBron. It's the only time I can remember odds just dropping in half off of one deal. But if you look at the tweet from uh, our, our friends at the Greek Sportsbook, yeah, here's a closer look at what the Clips got back in return for nine-time All-Star Chris Paul. Yeah, a bunch of second-tier talent. Of course, uh, all that great jerk chicken in Jamaica and those guys order KFC. What are they thinking? Uh, oh, it's Scott Kaminsky and company over at the Greek. Yeah, that's a dumb tweet. They did, like The Clippers did very well in this, and they got some good players as well. How about Sam Amick? The double whammy for the Clippers. CP3 isn't leaving if he truly believes LeBron's coming next summer. That prospect looking bleak. I'll disagree with that too. All these guys are free agents at the same time. Who knows what's going to happen? I don't think they'll be able to get Paul George either, so we'll see what Maury has up his sleeve. Uh, I don't think the Rockets are a 55-win team with this current roster that they have as they had to gut it and ship all these guys to get CP3. Do you think it'll work? With, uh, with Remember, Harden was the runner-up for the MVP a couple years ago playing the two, so CP3 will probably play point. Well, I'm sure CP3 will play point. And look, you know, you look at the picture. There, there's Doc Rivers showing CP3. Yeah, yeah, there are plenty of direct flights from L.A., uh, to Houston, and look, I mean, Chris Paul's been a superstar, okay? Since the Clippers got him, that was back in 2011, he made the All-NBA first team three times, the All-NBA second team twice, the All-Defensive first team six times. He's averaged 18.7 points, 9.8 assists, and 2.4 steals over the last six seasons. Yeah, he's a step or two slower now. Yes, he's a little bit older now, but the big question I have about this there's only one ball to go around. And you look at the graph right here, you know, Harden and Paul both last year, top 10 in touches, in terms of, you know, handling the basketball, top 10 in time possessing the basketball, and a top 10 in the number of passes that they threw. So it's two guys that play their best with the ball in their hands. Going to be an interesting coaching job for Mike D'Antoni, see if he can earn that Coach of the Year award twice in a row. And I'm not convinced that... Houston's done dealing. All the indications are they're going to try to pick up Paul George. I don't know if they have the the, uh, the pieces to put that deal together, but they're going to try, Pauly. And with Paul George, maybe you think about this team as being legit contenders against Golden State. Uh, no. Uh, CP3 was 49% catch and shoot threes last year. Harden was 38% as well. On to the bad beats, bad bets, bad for the books, bad bet. Also a ninth inning uh, blown lead by Diaz. Mariners bet up 40 cents to 225. King Felix was okay, but the Phillies rally off Diaz and win 5 4. Yeah, and, and again, I mean, Tommy Joseph with the home run off of Diaz in the ninth to tie it. Andrew Knapp singled in the winning run, and Diaz wasn't even in there to finish the inning. And this is a Mariners team again. They were buyers this past offseason. And here they are. We're just about going into July, and they're sitting in fourth place. 
They're below 500. They're double digits behind Houston. They're behind the Rangers. They're behind the Angels. This team can't be losing the series at home to Philadelphia. Has 225 favorites. Bad bet and a tough beat if you had Seattle on Wednesday. 20 cent move on the race. Never in it. Uh, rough start for uh, Snell. And the Pirates won 6-2. to two. Yeah, I mean, Snell struggled with his control all night. He walked three batters in the first inning, put Tampa in a 4-1 early hole, and they never climbed out of it. Rays cooled off by the Pirates, and the 20-cent move towards Tampa was money that the books got to keep. Hey, not bad by uh, Tanaka. 20-cent move on the White Sox never had a chance, and the judge did it again. His 27th home run. Look at the Ace of Spader tweet. First 74 games played, Babe Ruth, Maris, and Judge. Judge is right there in all the, in all the numbers, and, and I believe he would win the Triple Crown if the season ended today. Yeah, he certainly had a, a heck of a season. Of course, you know, it wasn't Carlos Rodon who got lit up for uh, the White Sox. All the money came in on Chicago to support him, despite the fact that they're you know, talking about a guy that went 0-4 with an ERA approaching 11 in his four minor league rehab games. He struggled to find the strike zone. Only 41 of his 94 pitches found the strike zone, but he left only down 3-1. Uh, and then the disastrous sixth inning for the White Sox bullpen, including that judge home run, uh, sent the game into blowout status. Bad bet on Chicago yesterday. Bad for the books. A huge move on the Blue Jays. Stroman was solid. He throws the shutout. Blue Jays bet up from $1.80 to two fifteen in this one. Yeah, and of course, uh, the books didn't get to keep all that money. They lost it all. And Wade Miley uh, struggled once again, gave up a leadoff home run to Jose Bautista and another one to Justin Smoke. And one night after we kind of stole a play of the day winner with Arizona, uh, Marcus Stroman killed our POD uh, on Wednesday. Dominant 7.2 innings of shutout baseball. All right, up next, big game breakdown. We'll start with the Cubs and the Nationals. Five day games on Thursday. And then we'll get to the NFC North with the Chicago Bears on Sportsbit. Betting Insight today on SBRPicks.com. Go to SBRodds.com. Browse, compare, and shop live odds available at top online sportsbooks. All right, back on Sportsbit. Betting Insight today. Time for Big Game Breakdown. Powered by Bet Online. And Bet Online is more than just an online betting platform. They boast a focus on the player approach and they built their reputation on offering clients nothing but the best from cutting edge technology, enticing promotions, and the latest sports betting odds. Powered by Bet Online, Cubs and Nationals. One o'clock Pacific first pitch. It's Lester against Ross. Nationals $1.13, nine and a half the total. Look at this tweet from ESPN Stats and Info. I mean, the Cubs, are, they are what, remember Parcells? You are what your record says you are. They're a 500 team. And this tweet, they're 11 and 19 against current playoff teams. A win percentage that ranks 22nd in MLB. They're 28 and 20 against the, all, all the other teams, Teddy. Yeah. <laughs> And, you know, again, we're talking about a 500-level baseball team right now. And, of course, it's a 500-level baseball team that isn't playing particularly well right now. Obviously, there are things going on in that clubhouse with the whole Miguel Montero situation over the past uh, 48 hours. Uh, you know, designated for his first, he throws Arietta under the bus, then he gets designated for assignment. Uh, then uh, the tweets come out. I love this one uh, from uh, Fuzzbeat Eli. Reporter, do you feel like you, Jake, you threw Jake under the bus? Montero, Arietta actually let the bus leave the station so early that I wasn't able to. Uh, you know, uh, of course, the guy who had allowed 31 of 31 steals uh, this season, you know, got the, he didn't play a whole lot, but he was designated for assignment. But that's obviously been an issue for John Lester uh, over the course of his career. He allowed 44 steals in 2015. That was an MLB high. But with Wilson Contreras behind the plate, nine out of the 17 guys that have tried to steal against him this season have been caught. But that really hasn't helped John Lester's game. Look at it. Again, last year, 19-5 and five with a 2.44 ERA. This year, 5-4, and 3.83. And it's not his fault. When you look at the advanced metric stats, basically, he's the same guy that he was last year. But the Cubs' defense behind him, this is something we talked about sports, on Sportsbit a number of times, Paulie. That Cubs' defense behind him isn't even close what it was a season ago. Look at the BABIP. Nearly 50 points higher. That's what accounts for his issues in 2017 compared to the stellar season last year. And of course, the offensive sport behind him could be an issue moving forward as well. Certainly for this game, Chris Bryant left last night with an ankle injury, twisted it by stepping on third base. 
He's listed as doubtful for this afternoon. So Ross also knows what it's like not to get a lot of help from his defense. Strikeouts per nine, 8.3 career high. Walks per nine, 1.9 career low. But the ERA is 5.40, a career high. The Nats defense allowing a 3-4-7 BABIP. Batting average of balls in play behind him. But the, the, the whole pitching staff knows they get plenty of help from the bats with Rendon and Murphy and all these guys can hit. Buster only tweet. Nationals started this game with four guys on pace to drive in 100 runs and four guys on pace to score 100 runs. It's scary, Teddy. Yeah, that certainly is an offense that has shown signs of breaking out on multiple occasions uh, this season. They broke out again yesterday, and I wouldn't be surprised if they break out again this afternoon. We'll get back to this game when it comes to play of the daytime. Up next, the Dodgers and the Angels, powered by Bet Online. Kershaw Ramirez. This is in Anaheim. Kershaw 210 on the road, seven and a half the total. Here we go again with Kershaw, who's been a nightmare for sports books. The Dodgers are 14 and 2 when he starts. He's already allowed a career high for home runs off the disaster with the Mets. He did pitch well against the Rockies, six shutout innings, escaped that base was loaded jam in the first. He was his normal self in that one. But you look at the numbers, Teddy. Now listen, he was unbelievable in 2016. But he's still been solid, but not the best pitcher on his own team. That would be Wood. Yeah, sure. And, and look, let's not understate Clayton Kershaw. He's, a, you know, if not the best pitcher in baseball, he's one of the best pitchers in baseball. But there's no question. Every one of his advanced metric stats is down from where it was a year ago. And hasn't made any difference to the bookmakers. I mean, Kershaw's been a nightmare for sports books. And the Dodgers, 14-2. and two, in his starts. They haven't been able to make a price high enough for Kershaw. But there are clearly some warning signs, some red flags, and it starts with the home runs. Last year, he gave up eight home runs in 149 innings. This year, he's given up 17 home runs in 109.1 innings. The difference in how the Dodgers have gone 14-2 and in his starts, despite the fact that he hasn't been as good this year as last year, the Dodgers are hitting for him, man. Five and a half, 5.6 runs per game, actually, with Clayton Kershaw on the hill. And you win a whole lot of games when you're averaging more than five and a half runs per game with Kershaw on the hill. And get ready. I talked to Jimmy Vaccaro from VEASAN. If the Dodgers play the Padres at home and Kershaw's going, you could see $5. Yeah, I was thinking four off the top of my head, minimum. Well, he was laying 375 in that game against the Mets, too. It went off at 375, so... Jimmy thinks he could see $5. It's rare when Kershaw's not the hardest thrower on the mound. That would be Ramirez. But he can develop, can he develop the rest of his game? Now up to 211 career innings pitched. An ERA of almost five. But look at the average fastball. Severino number one, Ramirez number two, and then Martinez. But what do you do with it? Look at the ERA, the FIP, and the strikeouts per nine. Throw that graphic up. Control not the problem. And the walks per nine are solid. And the ground ball percentage is good. It goes back to the home run fly ball percentage. 16.9 this season, 16.2 for his career. Just like Arietta we talked about earlier in the week. The high fastballs, are he's up in the strike zone, he's getting tagged. Yeah, and of course, look, when we talk about J.C. Ramirez, this is a guy who, when you're throwing the ball, an average of close to 97 miles an hour, okay, you, you expect him to figure it out at some point. You know, what he hasn't been able to do so far is avoid the mistakes and also Let's flash that graphic up one more time real quick. With Severino, Martinez, and Ramirez, the strikeout percentage isn't there. So even though he's throwing hard, he hasn't been able to throw past hitters yet. One would think at some point that'll come for Ramirez. Don't know if it's going to come today against that solid Dodgers lineup. All right, here we go. In my opinion, the worst team in the NFC. We start with the NFC North. The Chicago Bears up next in the play of the day on Sportsbit. Betting Insight today on SBRPicks.com. Research before you bet. Be sure to check out SPR Picks for the best game predictions, breakdowns, and much, much more. Wrapping it up on Sports Bit, Betty and Insight today. Time for the deep dive. The Chicago Bears, before we do that, the first conference, SBR conference, Teddy. Yeah, you got a chance. Hang out with me. You, come hang out with me. We got uh, Gil Alexander is going to be coming from the VSIN network. We have Matthew Holt uh, from CG Technology, all guys from Vegas, plus a host of other big names in the sports betting industry. Sportsbook Review's first international football betting conference is going to be August 4th and 5th in San Jose, Costa Rica. Find out all the details and sign up to get on the invite list 
at www.ifbc.live. And again, that's International Football Betting Conference, IFBC, www.ifbc.live. Come hang out. It's going to be fun. It's going to be a whirlwind trip for me. I'm flying in, flying out in a matter of 72 hours. But while I'm there, I'm damn well going to hang out, and I'm damn well going to have a good time, and hopefully we'll be able to give out some good information to everyone that comes. So check it out. Uh, www.ifbc.live The Bears win total five and a half under minus 150. Last year three and 13 straight up. How the hell are they going to win six games? Seven and nine ATS, seven, eight and one to the under. Mainstream stats, 11 takeaways, dead last. 31 giveaways, that was 30th. Minus 20 turnover margin tied for last with the Jets. Offense, 5.9 yards per play. Tied for fifth with the Pats, 4.6 yards per rush. Tied for fifth, 7.4 yards per pass attempt. Slightly above average and 28 sacks allowed. The defense, 5.5 yards per play allowed average, 37 sacks. Slightly above average. Opponents QB rating, 93.5 and 4.4 yards per rush allowed below average. All hell broke loose. Their fans hated the move. Hated it. And you saw it on draft day. They gave Glenn and all that money. And they traded up to take Trubisky. All the Bears fans and all the guys from Beeson who are from Chicago say this team is going to be awful, and I believe them. Okay, let's start. Okay, you just went through a ton of information, and I want to hit on a bunch of these points. All right, the Bears went 3-13 and last year. Why did they go 3-13? and Well, we just looked at their stats. They're tied with the Patriots with the number five offense in the NFL in yards per play. They're better than average rushing. They're better than average passing. They're better than average protecting the quarterback. Defense, average uh, yards per play allowed, average sacks. Their pass defense was dicey. Their run defense was dicey, but neither were miserable. Those are not the stats of a 3-13 and team. They're the stats of a 6-10 and team or a 7-9 and team, maybe an 8-8 eight and eight team. Hell, maybe a 9-7 and seven team. So how did they go 3-13? and 13? Well, number one, they had a quarterback problem. And number two, their defense didn't take they – didn't, they didn't have no takeaways. When you're minus 20 in turnovers, that's tied for dead last in the NFL with the Jets, and the teams that finished minus 20, there's one of them every couple of years or two, you know, uh, one or two a year uh, that'll be in that range. They all stink, and they all get better the next year. It's the nature of football. So when you say, where are the Bears coming from? And everyone in Chicago, there's not a person in Chicago that I know of, <laughs> and I know lots of guys in Chicago, that ever has a good feeling about the Bears going to the campaign and ever likes what management does. Um, we, we could talk about the draft and the Trubisky move in a moment, but let's make this clear. The Bears' stats were a lot better than a 3-13 and last year with the exception a 3-13 and team with the exception of turnovers. And they have a chance, obviously. You know, their turnover margin will be less than minus 20 this year, obviously. And they got a chance to turn it around turnover-wise in a big way if the moves that John Fox and company made in the offseason can actually make this defense a takeaway unit as opposed to a crappy unit. All right. I don't see that. Uh, I think Fox is a bad coach. He's still stuck in the 80s. He leads the league in punting from the opponent's 40 when it's fourth and one. Uh, Cause for concern if they get off to a slow start, which they will, they'll probably put Trubisky in there and he won't be ready and also there's no I don't like their skill position players White can't get on the field hasn't been able to stay healthy Jordan Howard's nice but other than that I who's gonna who's gonna make any plays for this team okay let's start with the John Fox thing okay I'm not in love with John Fox and I'm with you on some game management stuff that makes me nuts that being said John Fox took the Carolina Panthers in their second year of existence they were an expansion team he took them to the Super Bowl, to the, a, to the NFC Championship game, and then later, to a, so the second year they were in the championship game. Later they went to a Super Bowl. Uh, then you, you look at what happened in Denver. And obviously, he took another team to a Super Bowl. So you say, all right, I, this coach's time is... No, he did not. Not in Denver. That was Kubiak. He didn't win the Super Bowl. He took them to the Super Bowl. Yes. Yes, no question. He took two. He didn't win the Super Bowl in Carolina either, but he took two different teams into the Super Bowl. You can't tell me that the guy doesn't know how to coach on some level when you've gone that far twice. Okay, once could be a fluke, twice can be a fluke. Maybe there's something to like about John Fox. And everyone was like, last year, second year, here's John Fox. Everything's going to go right for Chicago, and everything went wrong. And now they're saying, oh, well, third year he's an idiot. He doesn't know anything. Maybe the improvement comes this year. 
as opposed to last year. Let's look at the draft before we get into the skill position talent stuff. Obviously, the big move for Trubisky, uh, the, the number two pick, uh, he's being called a tight end, Adam Shaheen. He's uh, one, an athlete. Um, uh, the, then you're talking about fourth round and fifth round guys. So really, the top two picks in the draft, Chicago can't expect to get a ton from this year. Trubisky's got a shot, a shot to start. Uh, even though they paid Mike Glennon, certainly has a shot to start. If the season goes in the tank, Trubisky likely will start. But when you look at how Chicago might be better this year compared to last year, it's not going to be because of the draft. Another thing, there is, they, they've been horrible for a long time at home. 6-18 and 18 straight up the last three years in an ATS disaster. Yeah, and really, you can go back further for the ATS disaster. I mean, they've been very... Very, very bad point spread team at home for a number of years. Everyone says, oh, the Bears are going home. They're live. You know, <laughs> that's your classic talking head uh, comment on TV. Uh, there hasn't been a home field edge at Soldier Field. And, and, and when I make my home fields, I do it each individual team. And the Bears are always near the bottom for home field advantage. But let's talk about what's right. You don't like the skill position talent. talent I'm there with you. You don't like the uh, quarterback position. No problem. Let's talk about the rest of the roster because they made a lot of good moves this offseason. I know they used only one draft pick on a defensive player, but they signed Quentin Demps. And I know he's not a, uh, a, a young uh, uh, safety, but he's someone who will help. And they got Prince Amakumara uh, from the Giants. I think that's a good deal. They got Marcus Cooper, who's looked decent for the Chiefs and the Cardinals. That's three upgrades in a secondary that was awful last year. Three new starters, and all three of them are upgrades over anyone was on that team a season ago. Now, the other thing that Chicago has that makes me think that they may be better than people expect this year, their offensive line's rock solid. You know, you have the left guard and Josh Sitton, the, uh, the center Cody Whitehair, the right guard Kyle Long. All three of those guys, I don't know if they're Pro Bowl caliber, they're solid players. They've had problems at the tackle positions uh, and Lino and Massey. But overall, that offensive line, I think, is a lot better than people are giving them credit for. So the secondary has been upgraded. The offensive line has been upgraded. And those are two areas where the betting markets sometimes don't exactly get excited about, and they matter so much over the course of the season. Uh, I'm not as bearish on this team as you are, uh, Polly. I'm really not. You're a piece of work. I see. In, I see in the schedule. You're, you, you with the schedule breakdown. You can see they could start one and seven. Yet you somehow think they're going to win six games, but you think they're going to start one and seven. Well, okay. The Bears are exactly the kind of team. I'm telling you, I've, I'm pretty good at season wins. You know that, okay? They're exactly the kind of team that starts the season one and seven, two and six, and then goes, you know, five and three in the back half with a lame duck coach after Fox has been fired and Trubisky wins them game, and they when they win six games to beat you. I'm telling you. And of course, remember. They opened five. South Point opened five on the Bears. A lot of books opened five. And all the early money came in on the over. The very first bets were coming over on Chicago. It's only later that we've seen a little bit of under money come in. That's why it's minus 150 on the under right now. But you look at this schedule. Yeah, it's tough. And the first half is absolutely brutal. The NFC uh, North faces the AFC North and the NFC South. There are two extra games at Philadelphia and San Francisco. You can split a one and one right there. But when you look at the start of the season, you know, they have Atlanta at Tampa, Pittsburgh at Green Bay. That's 0-4 written all over it. I'm with you. And at 0-4, all of a sudden, Trubisky's in play and, the you know, everyone comes out. But if they can steal one of those games, maybe all of a sudden things get a little bit easier. Because certainly the back half of the campaign where they get the Lions at home and they get the Browns and they get San Francisco and Cincinnati – uh, you know, uh, two games against the Lions on uh, home and road, you know, they have a chance to finish the second half of that season with, you know, four and four or five and three. I'm not betting this team under, Paul. Uh, Paul yeah, I'm just not going to do it. I think there is hope for Chicago. And from a point spread perspective, I think we'll make money with this team this year. I really do. All right, we disagree on that. Although I, you could probably take them week one against Atlanta. The Super Bowl loser has been a horrible ATS in week one. All right. Tomorrow, the Detroit Lions. Boy, are they going to make a huge mistake coming up. We'll get to that <laughs> on tomorrow's show. All right, play of the day, money time, early start, 1 o'clock Pacific, 9.04. The Nats, $1.13 at bet online. One of these teams is hitting. The other one isn't. One's playing good ball. Again, the other one is 11-19 against playoff teams, current playoff teams, which is 22nd in the league. 
Nationals in a day game. Cubs, total mess right now. 500 team, they stink. Let's go with the Nationals in this one. That is the play of the day. We're back. We started, we came back Monday from vacation. Tell your friends, I see the views right at where they were when we went on vacation. And everyone loves the new graphics. So do we. So tell your friends we're back in football right around the corner on Sportsbit. Betting Insight today on SBRPicks.com. Thank you.